Okay, William Smart is the founder and creative director of Smart Design Studio. Before establishing his practice in 1997, William worked for Gersau Architecture in France and then Foster and Partners in London, working on a number of award-winning projects. Smart Design Studio has a reputation as a highly successful multidisciplinary design studio with a diverse range of projects, including master planning, multi-unit residential developments, private residences, commercial, cultural, and retail spaces. Smart Design Studio produces buildings and interiors of elegant simplicity and high level of design excellence. It is interesting to note that the studio is run with four separate teams, each with its own area of specialization. I won't go into that in detail. William might mention it, but there's the interior design team, there's the architecture team, there's the private residential team, and the multi-apartment team. William believes that this cross-fertilization of ideas produces projects that are more innovative with higher quality results, while also managing the risk of cost, quality, and time overruns. William is directly involved in every project, contributing at all stages from design to final delivery. His enthusiasm and passionate attention to detail is fundamental to the studio's success, motivating a highly dedicated team of architects and interior designers to realize projects of high quality and innovation. Smart design studio buildings and interiors have received critical, acc critical acclaim, won prestigious awards, and have been widely published. However, it is their most recent project, Indigo Slam, a new residence for Judith Nielsen, the owner of White Rabbit Gallery in Sydney, that is likely to bring Smart Design Studio more recognition than ever before. I know that William will be showing that project, so I will say no more than that. Please welcome William Smart. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Bob, for asking us. And thank you, Brickworks, for hosting this event. And thank you all for coming tonight. Um, Smart Design Studio is a practice of 45 people. And I'm kind of closely involved with that. Most of our work is residential work on different scales. But we really look for opportunities to be creative. And tonight, I want to show you two projects, Indigo Slam the house that was mentioned by Stephen, and also a little block of flats we just finished. They're both shortlisted for awards, which will be announced next Friday, so we've got our fingers crossed. The first project, Indigo Slam, started with a phone call from a wonderful art patron by the name of Judith Nelson, who started White Rabbit Gallery. Some of you, some of you might know that. Um, and she called me and said, I need you to start uh, to work on a new house on Monday for me, and I want it to be the best house in Sydney. Um, if you can't start, then I'm going to call Frank Gehry. <laughs> and I was in. The, the house was, uh, is here, and this is a little area in Sydney called Central Park, which is an old brewery site, and she thought it would be wonderful to live on this new park in the city, right in the middle of the action, and White Rabbit is just here. And she wanted to walk to work and shop at Woolies and, and just be a part of the community, which is very different um, for you know, the wealthy of Sydney. So I proposed to Judith to commence the project with an idea of a language for the house that would flow through everything from all the materials to all parts of design. And the language is this, to take a piece of cardboard or concrete or copper and to cut that and fold that and bind that and that be the language that run through. And we talked about the house being like a piece of sculpture to live in, but really being a house that was a very sculptural house rather than a, just a piece of sculpture. These are pieces that I love and we used as reference points. So, so my job then is to take that idea, stay focused on that for the whole project and to, to look for a way of making a house out of this. And so in our studio, the way we work is we build models, we play with options, we do drawings, we do cab modelling at the same time, and we start to look for form. And with a house, it really has to be a house, and the kinds of things I was concerned with were privacy on the park, with shading to the house, with um, 
trying to, to build something which reflected this person's personality. And I have this idea that our studio uh, works on the ideas of form and function, but also the idea of purpose. And for Judith, this house has a much higher purpose than to, to just be a house. And the kinds of things she does is she uh, asks for the house to have a dining hall for 60 people. And she hosts events there, which she will pay for entirely. And the idea of the event is that you come along and you spread the word. So I went to a function recently for Anti-Slavery Australia, and then my mission is to spread the word. And it's wonderful. But you can see through all these sketches I'm showing you, this idea of the bending and the folding runs through all parts of the house, from the form of the building to the way different rooms work in the house, to the balustrades, to the ceilings, um, through to joinery, and then staircases and handrails and um, tiles in bathrooms. And it's just a very simple idea. And with this language, we built a house, and I'll show you the house and how we made it. Um, and it's kind of a wonderful project. Another, another aspiration of the project is to, to have a life of over 100 years and for everything to be very manual and very sustainable. So an example of that was all the, I'll go back to the last slide. Um, actually, no, it's forward a bit, but we had opportunity to design door handles and we made all the windows on the house fixed and then shutters above, you know, up high and down low in every room can be opened by, by winding a handle like a hill's hoist. And we had an opportunity to make those out of brass and cast them. And this idea of the language links everything together. And you, you can be a judge of whether that holds or not. So we went through this long design process and, um, and then we submitted this to the council. And it takes an old warehouse site and retains three walls that are built on boundaries and within that we build an entirely new house. Um, it has solar panels on the roof as you can see, top light, the three uh, walls of south, west and east are blank because they're hard to the boundary and then it opens up to the north. This is the idea of what the house is to look like from the front and a lot of this is off the glazing mullions. It's all in situ concrete and is is trying to capture light, bounce light, create privacy, undercover areas, and manipulate light in different ways. On the south half of the house, we built this long stair hall, and all the floors everywhere in the house are brick, the same brick throughout. And then the little guest house at the back takes the same language again, and tries to marry with the terraces of the street. Um, that's the internal courtyard. And so the floor plans themselves are quite um, regular in a way. There's little flourishes like rounded bathrooms and so forth. There's a big dining hall for 60 on the ground floor and therefore a commercial kitchen, a little courtyard, a wonderful guest house at the back, which I haven't photographed yet. And then um, back to the last slide, four bedrooms, four bathrooms on the middle floor in a void. And then on the top floor, a private lounge, dining room, TV room and a kitchen. And we're, we're photographing the house properly now because we wanted to wait for the winter light, which is exquisite in this house. And then uh, from that point in time, it's a labour of love. We've been building it for four years. Um, I've personally been visiting site three times a week for four years, um, which I, I normally go for my jog in the morning and hang out with the builders as well. I love it and these are parts of the house. So it's documented in 3D. Every brick is set out in the house. Every tie rod is set out on the facades. There's, there's nothing left to chance. And these are kind of great documentation drawings and then how we built it. Oh yeah, yeah, okay. And then the other parts of the house. So this language of peeling and folding is most evident in the concrete. And then of course we find 
amazing people to work with and the idea that we had with uh, accumulating consultants and people to build the house is that they be people with, that would make it better. And this fella, I'll use my pointer, is a, a wonderful old friend of mine, an amazing engineer. And then these guys are, our, our guys in the studio, laying out bricks and playing around with them. The client is here. And then this guy is a furniture maker from Adelaide, Kailu, who does the most beautiful furniture. And all the furniture was uh, commissioned for the house as one-off pieces. And then this is kind of the construction. So we pulled down the old warehouse and propped up the walls. We dug down into the basement. The house has geothermal heating and cooling, which means we have 17 bores that go 100 meters down into the ground to harness the temperature of the earth, which is 17 degrees all year round. And really in summer, the house works on pipes running through all the floors that reticulates water from the ground that is un unconditioned with a little bit of top up air conditioning. Um, so it's kind of, it's always 21 degrees, it's always 50% humidity and all that's done in incredibly sustainable ways. This is the basement which we made in traditional brick arches. So see here you have on the last <coughs> slide formwork, on the next slide bricks laid over that and then we skim them and render them like icing a cake and then you pour the concrete slab across the top and you get these wonderful vaults on on very skinny little columns and then build the main part of the house. It's kind of funny looking back at these slides because you forget it all. This, these, um, these are the glazing mullions here for the house and they were brought and craned into position and they hold up most of the facade and I'll show you why when we get down to it later and then pouring concrete and then the facade taking shape from the inside. And I think what happened at the start of the job is the builder had no idea. The builders had no idea what they were building and then gradually they became really excited about it. <laughs> and then tile prototyping and setting out. And then this, this part of it, the concrete on the back on the last slide. This part here is the hardest part to pour. It's very hard to pour concrete where the top surface is visible. Um, and then that's it, taking shape in the city. And then out in uh, Albury Wodonga, which is about an hour's flight out of Sydney, we found a guy who could make all of these, oops, all these brass armatures. This is prototyping it all and checking that it would all work beautifully. And so every little piece was custom made and tested. And then pouring more concrete, including internal walls and building barrel vaulted ceilings. And all of the internal surfaces are rendered, unpainted, waxed, rendered walls and ceilings. And then building the formwork of the building taking shape through here. I might add that every window in the house has a different view. One of the bedrooms can look out with a beautiful frame view of the park. One has a horizontal view for the children, the grandchildren's bedroom. Another one has a vertical view and another one can only look up and down. Um, and then the porch and the balcony and you can really start to see the house taking sh shape here. and building this great staircase and then the barrel vault taking place. So you can start to see through there a room which has 14 metre high ceilings which is just wonderful and then more intimate spaces that are off the side of that. Geothermal uh, water pipes running through the floor and staircase taking shape and then bathrooms and baths made out of little marble tiles. And then all of the window armature going into place, which is brass and will gradually brown off. But we had all of these gearboxes and so forth visible from the outside. And then the light coming in. 
and then laying the claws. It was interesting going through with the jury because um, I was a bit worried that doing a very large house kind of loses your points when it comes to an architecture jury. And they arrived and they sort of had a little bit of attitude and I thought, oh, here we go. <laughs> and we came into the house and gradually they were seduced by the light and a 20 minute tour turned into an hour and it started to all slow down and be a great experience. But it's very hard to capture the spatial qualities and the light in these photographs and also the amount of work, like just, you know, this corner here with the bridge, there's a glass bridge with no structure to it that spans across this part of the house. Getting that to all work was like really hard actually. <laughs> and this is sort of, we haven't, as I said, we haven't really photographed the inside of the house properly, but you're starting to see it a little bit more finished with the furniture starting to go in for testing and the cellar and so forth through here. And so this is really the final result onto the street. And what you have is this uh, concrete facade that adds a lot of privacy. So living in the house feels very comfortable on a park in the city. And a light scoop here that bounces light into the room. It's got a really beautiful light quality because it bounces light up onto the ceiling and therefore the ceiling glows in the room balcony through here, little porch through there. Someone said that looks like a monorail station. Um, what we call the skirt here, which shadows, uh, shades the big dining hall down in this area. The bedrooms are all through here. There's a 25 metre reflection pool and a gate through here. So when you walk into this part, you stand beneath the 15 metre high portico, which is really dramatic. The other way it really opens up a bit more to the, to the park and the city. So it has this beautiful tall, that's the portico you're walking under, but a great view back to this wonderful building by Jean Nouvel called Central Park with plants all over the outside. And you can see through here um, all of the armature. And it kind of has a really, um, like it's, it's clearly very sculptural, but it has a really joyful quality to it because it feels so playful in the city. I think back there you can probably all read the, the peeling and folding of the facade. It's conceptually made out of one sheet. And then this is the kind of work of the engineers. The, the idea we had for the house is that it feel impossible. So all of these, oops, wrong way. All of these concrete pieces are supported off the glazing mullions. So what you get there is this kind of extraordinary quality of light from coming to the glass, coming down behind that. And then when you stand and look at it, you can see this point where it's 150 mils of concrete and you can see one side and the other side, and no structure holding it. And it's perfectly straight because we calculated the pre canvas and got all that to work. And then as we're building it, you know, it's really exciting to see these kind of beautiful shapes and shadows and um, it really taking shape. And then on the ground plane, it kind of, um, it has this wall, which is about, probably about this high above the ground, so you can't quite see into the dining room. The dining room is up another meter, so you get a lovely view out of the park and then a pond running on the front to reflect kind of great light up to the building. The gate is a big sliding gate out of Corten steel and we just cut the blades a little bit back. So they're 50 mil blades and they're recessed 10 mils to, 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 to carve effectively the name of the house. And it's, the name is just a book that Judith likes called Indigo Slam, it's a crime novel. She bought it at the airport and thought, that's the name of my house. <laughs> and I knew when she told me that story that that meant uh, much more than that. And I asked her about it and she said, well, she'd always been told where to live and what to name the house and after the third grandmother or whatever. <laughs> and this time it was just about being free and doing what she wanted. Um, very long 25 metre reflection pool. Um, she wanted some 
little pictures of little fishes carved into the bottom of the pool and, and then we agree we'd do a little poem in the bottom of the pool that would be about the light and the qualities of light and, and dreaming and stuff like that. And then the window is opening in the house so you can see through there the glass is always fixed. The shutters are made up of doors so it's a timber door with aluminium on the front and the back and these brass armatures here open and close between six and nine windows in succession. So you wind one handle and all of the, the six windows in the bedroom on the bottom open and that's great for ventilation in winter because you want the air to come in from below. In summer you open up the top ones and you get a nice breeze through there but it's just winding it from handles and then these are kind of some of the final uh, spaces. So these kind of beautiful classical rooms that have a kind of a twist to them and a modernness to them. And she's kind of an amazing art collector. Um, so we got to put in their beautiful pieces of art. So this traditional Chinese painting here is made from one million nails. They're just little nails hammered into a wall and there you can see this kind of language of peeling and folding, building a house that's got to do all the things that a house has to do. And then looking down through uh, the stair hall, so a beautiful 14 mil metre high ceiling, and the barrel vaults through here just peel away to let northern light into those rooms, or down through here, or down through the back at that point. Some of the ceilings we made very low. One of the datum heights is about 2.04 metres, which is due to this height when she reaches up. And all of these corridors have very low ceilings, which is quite exciting off the side of a very tall space. And then little details. These are kind of brick detailing. It was a lot of fun. Uh, working with these guys and laying out the bricks and although we, we catted them all up generally we'd go out and just lay out a room together so I was up on site last week laying out the courtyard bricks with the guys and we just test them all out and then when I go back next week they'll be done and we got to make all these things so little hatches in the floor for floor boxes as well as handrails that are leather clad with little brackets that reflect the theme of the house this is the bridge that crosses um, the void, which has no structure in it. And you can see through there that the details all follow through everywhere. And the guys are just, they got right into this detail and loved how beautifully it's made. <laughs> and then the spaces, that's Judith's study through here. And she looks out to a white wall when she looks. And then kind of beautiful spaces. There's a little Juliet balcony through here that peels away. And because uh, the palette is so limited, so it's hard set rendered walls unpainted, brick floors, marble in the bathrooms, and wood for the shutters, it, it has a tremendous sense of continuity through the house. Now she's a very famous art collector, but she thinks the house doesn't need much art. It's better to leave it empty, which is really nice of her to see. And then the other thing I wanted to, to make it feel like it is it was made for her and for a lady so it's got a very kind of I think a very delicate touch to it and you know places for everything like your hairdryer and then we made this copper bath um, which has a little seat on the end where you can sit in there and then the floor grates are all recessed, so it's quite um, kind of spare in its detail in many ways. The kitchen's through here, and I guess again the, the idea of the user inspires the detail, so she has quite arthritic hands and therefore we designed all the way the doors open to, to kind of be really generous and, and comfortable. Oops, jumped and then little touches of peeling and folding through all the details. 
and this is kind of great. We got uh, slabs of granite and you cut them and then you can rejoin them and you can't see the joints and then you carve out of it. And then all the, the blinds on the house are all shutters that were made up so we could expose all the mechanisms through the slot and all of these you manually open and close with a chain. Would have been much easier to, uh, to make them motorised but that's not the house's brief. And then lastly there's a little winder on the window. So that's kind of a wonderful, um, a very bespoke project that's been a lot of work and we're photographing it now properly um, and hoping to publish at the end of the year. This is a much more functional one and this, is, this project's aspiration was to do more than the bog standard with a block of flats in Sydney. And um, for those of you who know who's Sydney, this is a manly walk over here, manly beach. And there's a little area here called Balgala, which is a, a kind of a, it's, it's a good area, but not a kind of particularly fancy area. So the owners came to us with a brief for building a block of flats and their obsession was to get as much as they could onto the site. And then through ideas of exploring form and structure and, and how we might make these spaces work in a similar way to Indigo Slam, we started to, to really understand what the project could be and our aspiration became to build a brick apartment building to blend with the brick buildings of the area but to do it all with concrete interiors and so the, the idea was to be more authentic than a plasterboard box and so the whole design process for us became how you would build this and this is how we did it and so we designed the construction process we made it all as tilt up because tilt up concrete is very cheap and you, what you do for that is you pour the walls as slabs on the ground and then you tilt them up into place and that means we're tilting up <coughs> four storeys of walls in one go which is exactly the width of the property and then once you tilt them all up you prop them together and then you bring in concrete slabs now concrete slabs, getting the underside of a concrete slab as I've learnt on these concrete houses is very easy um, if you use galvanised reinforcing and, um, and you, you're reasonably careful with how you control the services. Doing walls is hard and that's why we do them as tilt up. Then after that we put a lightweight top on the house and some, oh, on, the, on the apartment building and then some little partition walls that go in the balcony spaces and then brick facades on the outside of the building. And then cores within the space and a roof and that's the building. So it has a lightweight top, brick facades on north and south, light wells on either side, and it's almost symmetrical. So this is the mirror of that apartment and they're pretty much mirrored on the front and back. And then a little idea we had with the facade was to make double height spaces. So if you had this apartment, you could look up a double height space or down to the level below. And therefore your private balcony was is off to the side and then you could um, or in the middle through here and get some spatial dynamic and some beautiful light qualities. Commercial floor downstairs and then those mirrored apartments going through the building and then up again and then set back top floors which are supposed to be in a roof space because the client's obsession was to get as much space as they could into the building and then brick facades and I love um, brick what we use through here is a system called Ancon which is a way of getting all of the lintels invisible so they're, they're like suspended bricks on the edges and these were the renders we prepared for the clients and for the council and the ideas of what the interior spaces might be like and then how that might translate and so the construction was to take this site here and knock that down, tilt up our concrete walls, very easy to get a good finish on tilt up concrete and it's not hard to get them into place, prop them and then pour concrete slabs going up through the building which wasn't galvanised in this case and the problem with not galvanising is when it rains the rust runs off so you had to top hole in it all and then all the services have to be carefully positioned so that you 
get them in exactly the right spot. And then building up through the building. Under colour. Commercial spaces. Brickwork, so mitred corners and the same, exactly the same brick as used Indigo Slam, which is an austral brick called Cement Hill Silver. And then kind of quirky details in parts. And then that's the start of the Ancon system, so it's got little hangers in between the bricks that hold it down so you get those lovely reveals and then taking shape. And I quite like that combination of brick and concrete together. I think it's really nice. Internally, it, it was never meant to be an industrial type of project, so we wanted to bring some precision in there. And to do that, we put all of our services in a core in the centre of the apartments. So there's a kitchen and then two bathrooms and the robes consolidated into that space as well as a laundry and then tiled floors solid balustrades to give you some privacy and then kind of glossy tiles on the floors to lift it and give it some great precision in the space. All the glass line is set back and then the spaces. And then these are the kind of spatial qualities you get from looking up and down. You can look down to the street or you get a punctuation of light from above and then quirky details and night entrances. And so the, the achievement for us is building this for $2,500 a square metre, which in Sydney is cheap. From above, you can see the lightweight black box of um, the apartments that have to fit within a roof form by the council. This kind of patterning of the double height spaces through the building and the bricks that run across the facade. The south side of the building has these wonderful lemon-scented gums and another story to it, so it's a really beautiful facade of the building. Very plain, I think, as well. And there you can see the, the detail. And then those little quirks, like the way that the entry is denoted through there. It looks like a door, but it's just brickwork leaning back colour in all, all the common areas. So we went to town with contrasting colours in doorways. And then the spaces internally are really quite, quite simple and restrained. So you can see through there the centre core, which contains kitchen, bathrooms and laundry. Everything in the kitchen is integrated. It's all kind of very gridded up, so all the panels are identical. The kitchens are all black, including taps and ovens. Big lights. We, we, I mean, often we'll talk to manufacturers about taking an off-the-shelf product and making it better. So this is a kind of a daggy one that we said paint it black, make the, the bottoms flat. <laughs> and they, they, they get on board. And then details of the space, sorry. In the bathrooms, we went through that um, theme of black and cream and did all the joinery in black, including taps and loos and basins. Mm -hmm. And then on the top floor, where there's no concrete, it's just a very white, simple space. So that's... Um, kind of working very hard for your money and trying to do uh, go further with, without paying more. Um, just to conclude, I just wanted to show you a couple of slides of what we're doing at the moment. We're doing a 26-storey hotel building in the city in Brick, which we're super excited about. And then this is the latest one we're working on, which is going out for tender in two weeks. It's called The Rock. It's the Rail Operations Centre for Sydney. And this building... Um, is where Sydney trains will control all of their rail operations from. These arches are um, 66 metres long, so really long brick arches and a kind of wonderful brick building with a big staircase running through the, the centre of it. 
and um, another big artist, the main side, side. The concept for the building was to present itself as a piece of railway infrastructure for the people that worked in the, the trains. And this is what they call the control room. It's a great space to see. They have these big TV screens and they monitor all the trains. And you can see whether they're running on time or running late and then when they're too late, a whole lot of other people kick in and do their jobs. <laughs> so that's kind of the next one to show you in a couple of years, I hope. <laughs> Thank you. Matt Gibson is the director of Matt Gibson Architecture and Design. Before establishing his practice in 2003, Matt gained wide and varied, varied experience within various architectural, uh, architectural and interior design offices, both in Australia and the UK. Matt Gibson Architecture and Design has produced numerous projects with a vi wide variety of types and scales and prides itself on being able to provide rigorously generated design solutions. The practice's growth has been based on promoting the principle of innovation and collaboration, whilst truly fusing the disciplines of architecture and interior design within a medium-sized practice. Matt Gibson Architecture and Design has received numerous awards over several categories from the Design Institute of Australia and the Instru Australian Institute of Architects, and recently received the Bell Coco Republic Designer of the Year Award for 2015 and was a finalist in Wallpaper Magazine's Best New Private for 2016. Best New Private. Nice category. <laughs> Mag Gibson is currently a guest tutor at Melbourne University and Deakin University's Schools of Architecture. He was a juror at the 2016 Australian Interior Design Awards and Dulux Colour Awards. He's a member on the AIA Victorian Chapter Awards Committee and the convener of the AIA Victorian Chapters Medium Practice Forum, a very interesting forum which we might talk about later. Matt was elected a Fellow of the DIA in 2011 for services to the interior design industry. Please welcome Matt Gibson. Thank you, thanks Stephen and thanks Bob. Um, I might just say that I feel very much the warm-up act to, um, to William's work. Um, uh, Indigo Slam is just incredible. I think it's one of the most spectacular buildings that Australia's seen for some time and I know William knows that, uh, that, that I, uh, I rave about it. Um, but sometimes, sometimes buildings can just transcend you. Um, and um, you can talk about jurors coming over and talking about big house, small house, but that is just um, sometimes uh, great architecture is just great architecture. There's concrete, detailing, light. It's just it's a, it's a knockout. Anyway, um, back to back to back to back to me. Uh, <laughs> um, so uh, we're a uh, so we're an architecture and interior design practice um, that really we're, we're a small practice we're um, ten, about 10 staff and uh, we think we're kind of that real nexus between architecture and interiors um, I'm an architect by trade but I worked in London for a number of years with an interior design with an interior designer and so when I came back I had a real kind of uh, interior sensibility if you like um, and we, um, we're actually looking similar to what Will's doing, I think, to actually setting up kind of a real interior side of our business. But I must say, we think of architecture and interior and landscape as a holistic design kind of um, uh, exercise. So um, what I'm going to show you today is uh, a little embarrassing video um, of myself from the Idea Awards last year, just talking about our... Um, <coughs> here it is. Great honour for our office to be nominated for Designer of the Year. 
We're an architecture and interior design office uh, that we think truly kind of navigates that space between those two disciplines. Uh, a lot of our projects, in, in fact, integrate those two um, uh, aspects of the buildings um, wholeheartedly. We work predominantly in the residential um, sector, but over the years have carried out retail, uh, corporate, hospitality, and, and institutional. And we actually love and promote this variety. So really, along with landscape, um, it's a holistic approach to, to the spatial environment. I think what characterises our work is a fascination um, with, with, with dichotomies. So dichotomies of materiality, uh, of light, uh, of lack of light, um, inside and outside, um, and, and what has come before and, and what is new. And, and, and I guess above all, we're kind of interested in spaces that evoke an emotional response. Well, our process involves um, um, a lot of uh, listening and observing. So when we meet a client, there's a lot of disparate elements that come into play. Um, you're dealing with a unique site, client's background and culture. Um, and so really it's about bringing these disparate elements together and, and kind of picking and choosing and selecting um, what elements you might carry forward. I think the act of engaging a designer um, in, in all cases really is, is a statement about the client's future. Above all for us, it's, it's how can we add to, how, how can we empower, um, you know, add to the quality of mind, the quality of life and the quality of the space. We start a project by, by research. In a sense, I kind of like it to this kind of murder mystery. Um, it's, it's a case of um, you know, listening, observing, gathering all the evidence, and, and following different routes of inquiry that might lead you to the obvious answer. I don't think we have a signature style. I think it's, um, I think if you look at our projects, you will see that there is, there may be some similarities, but I think they are all, um, you know, driven from each individual client's own situation. We think that detail um, and the ability to, to do a beautiful detail that goes beyond what's expected can really help to um, kind of clarify a concept and an idea. So that's a really important aspect to us. Bang, bang. <laughs> uh, so that's a little bit about where we're, we're kind of where we come from, I guess. But um, I've, I've I've got three or we've got five projects to show you tonight. Three uh, have been uh, fi finished and photographed, and there's two others that have haven't been photographed yet. So they've they've actually just been finished in the last uh, few months. And um, if I get time, I will um, go through all those. So um, and they're all residential projects. Uh, we, I mean, we do a mix of different things, but residential is our mainstay and. Um, we're a yeah, small Melbourne practice that does um, projects between you know, half a million and uh, four or five million. Uh, we don't necessarily select. We, um, uh, we, we, you know, we, we select clients based on, on who they are and, and what, I guess what they offer. Um, so anyway, this is Abstract House. This is a house in, um, in, uh, in Albert Park in Melbourne. Uh, it's a, uh, a double fronted Victorian building and so we're engaged to uh, to, to provide um, uh, an extension to the rear, which was obviously t uh, two storey. Um, so this is just the site analysis. This is the, the Architecture Awards um, presentation, so they're um, a little bit kind of geared up that way. But um, basically, here, this is the site. Um, we had a site condition where there were um, buildings that um, on either side that extended deep into the site. So we had a, a little bit of a planning free kick, if you like, to kind of extend um, quite deep into the site. Um, I mean, the clients were a couple who lived in London at the time and they came back to Melbourne, um, well, they came back to Sydney actually to live, and so they were never actually in Victoria. So a lot of, a lot of the design uh, was done remotely. Um, and, um, uh, and they came with a bit of a kind of a, a, this British modernist kind of sensibility. Um, and so most of their scrapbooks of images had kind of come back with a, yeah, quite a kind of European modernism. Um, uh, guys to them. So, anyway, um, we uh, this was the existing building. So the, the 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 fabric of integrity was this these front four rooms, and then we removed this this rear um, uh, element to the building, a lean-to structure. You can see here the existing site has uh, deep kind of high walls to the boundaries, uh, and then this was uh, removed. I mean, the original owners of the house um, actually had owned the house, it was a deceased estate, so they'd owned the house for almost 100 years, and um, um, so there had been little change. So uh, we removed the rear off the end, and then the, the new uh, land was um, plotted around the planning condition, but was also plotted around kind of getting northern light into the centre of the building. So we created a, a 
uh, a courtyard in the middle, and we often like to do that. We like to texture the building up with, um, um, you know, uh, views to gardens and um, interstitial spaces that break up old and new and, and tell a story, if you like, of, of um, existing and proposed. Um, and then the upper story was um, grouped in a, in a similar kind of arrangement. Um, and uh, many iterations were gone through, and in the end, um, we grouped uh, a set of spaces around around a central corridor and a, a long, around a, a kind of a strong movement access and um, visual kind of um, wayfinding, if you like, through the building. Which we um, a lot of our projects kind of do a similar thing. They like to have a strong kind of movement link through the through the building. Um, in this case, it made sense to have the living spaces. We had a confined width, so a six metre wide um, kind of width to the living spaces were arranged through this area, and then there was a utility. Um, the utility spaces were kind of grouped around here through this more narrow um, air, uh, width. Uh, and then upstairs a group of sleeping arrangements were grouped and, and kind of forms were starting to arrange out of, out of this planning um, uh, methodology. Um, and there's a home office here for, 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 the, for Lisa, the wife. Um, and so uh, we built a model of, uh, uh, I guess, of forms and, and the way forms and materials were coming together. So we, there was an endearing kind of uh, red brick uh, object, which was the front building, which we wanted to continue through to, to become these utility spaces. And then the living spaces were grouped through this kind of footprint at the, at the, uh, the ground level, which we wanted to keep very open and, and free flowing through here. So extending that sense of interior through to exterior and um, in a sense, letting the house um, extend to its boundaries and, um, and not be kind of contained at all. Um, and then this object above was a, uh, was done in a zinc material and it just kind of purchased itself above the, uh, the ground footprint. Um, and so you can, you can see the rear of the building here with the brick, uh, the brick facade and the, I guess um, it's kind of uh, strongly diagrammatic um, um, this assemblage of forms and, in a sense, these abstracted forms um, um, and abstracted materials. So from front to rear, we've kind of abstracted um, and done a contemporary version, if you like, of, of um, the slate and the, and the brick from the front. Um, and you can see in this diagram here, so we're trying to keep similar colours and, and, and textures and um, to, from front to rear. Uh, so this was the existing plan. Um, the, front, the front four rooms uh, involved bedrooms generally and then the living spaces to the rear. So we uh, utilised those front spaces for the more formal spaces within the house. So there's a uh, sitting room and a dining room at the front, uh, a mat's, mat, the, the, uh, the client's uh, study and a guest bedroom and then it comes out and opens up into a more open arrangement. So there's um, uh, courtyard and living spaces and then that peel off that main spine and corridor and then the utility spaces here, so kitchen, scullery, uh, there's two stairs that grouped on top of each other, one down to a basement and a cellar and the other one that goes up to upstairs. Uh, and then upstairs was really sleeping quarters so there's an arrangement of bedrooms um, and Lisa's um, kind of uh, um, uh, office area that overlooks neighbours. Um, and so we disassembled the two objects, so there's the, 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 uh, the existing object and then the new object. Um, you can't quite see, it's, it's in grey, but um, anyway, there's, there's an interstitial kind of space between old and new here, and, and then this is, the, this is the section going the other way, so um, down, downstairs area and, uh, and, um, and upstairs. Um, so this is the interstitial zone here between old and new, and we tucked in a bedroom within the within the uh, within the, the roof. Um, it couldn't be seen from the street, so we often engage with heritage architects. We, um, uh, we 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 treat heritage very seriously, and we love doing um, heritage build. We love doing adaptations to heritage buildings. We love that kind of sense of storytelling between old and new. Um, and th just those connections, and I think that's the, the fun of kind of what we do is, um, you know, you get a number of things put in front of you and you make decisions about which fabric do we retain, what do we change, what do we renew. Um, and so this, uh, yeah, this, w w generally with brick, I mean, in this house we used a, um, I'll keep moving, um, we used a, uh, a Daniel Robertson brick, uh, which was a Roman brick, which, um, 
uh, was kind of a in contemporary incarnation, I guess, of the red brick. But then we also you use a lot of resalvaged brick, and you'll see it in, a, in a project coming up that we often try to resalvage the brick from the existing house. And and if if that won't do the whole thing, then we'll cut, we'll find some other brick that matches that brick. Anyway, this is the view down to the northern courtyard. Um, so getting kind of northern light through here, and and always having a view onto a garden space. Um, uh, you can see the view back here to the front door and um, we've tucked some doors into some pockets um, on either side and uh, I guess we really like that kind of sense of detail, that sense of inside outside and um, concealing all the, all the, all the glass and, and all, the, um, uh, all the glass and the, and the, and the blinds and, and everything so it's a completely clean um, uh, manipulation of space. Um, uh, so anyway, interstitial zones here between old and new and, and we've opened it up so th there's no columns, it's all uh, free-flowing. Uh, this is the existing house, so here we restored all the um, existing spaces, um, so kept all the cornicing and, and, and uh, skirting. And here you can see we kind of pop down that room above, in, so there's a lowered ceiling here and, and, a, and a taller ceiling here. So kind of sitting drawing room and di uh, dining room. And this then is into the rear spaces, which are more informal, and there's a more informal level of detail. Um, and again, the, kind of the connection with that green space. And view through to the rear. Uh, so here you can see through the uh, scullery and bedroom, which gets a view through to the pool which is there, and again, those grouping of architectural elements. So, I mean, originally we wanted to do the whole place in brick and, and originally have this all in brick and brick tiles all the way through, um, which got knocked on my head, I think, because it was, um, client thought it was, might have been too dark or oppressive. Um, but uh, we, we, we did utilise it in certain areas. Anyway, um, this is... Um, uh, the track which we custom developed with a fabricator that we use all the time. We use this on all our projects so it's a, it's a track and sill all in one. Um, so it's a drainage um, sill and track um, which means that we get this lovely flow of continuity of material so whether that's stone or whether that's timber we can run that inside outside um, and you can kind of see similarly here that we've buried the, the, uh, all the channels within the structure so that you can get this completely clean, um, unabashed um, kind of continuity of material. Um, so here was, this was the brick. So again, um, uh, yes, what, so we've used brick snaps here. So they've been glued to the ceiling um, and we've used that in another project as well. Um, so it's, I guess, it, look, it's a more budget driven response than, uh, than, than other projects, but um, um, that's what we used here, yeah. So this is the view from Lisa's uh, uh, study space out uh, um, over the suburb. And again, so it's a kind of a, a, a manipulation of heights and um, volumes. And so this is this undercroft, I guess, through here. We, we wanted to keep the stair away um, from, the, from the main kind of circulation space. And lighting is the other key thing. So getting that ambient light at night time and that moodiness is is important. This is the, the stair down to the basement and there's a vaulted um, cellar, so a vaulted ceiling uh, in, in the cellar and this came from a, uh, and there's a little bit of Louis Kahn in it as well, but um, um, anyway, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mirror on a mirror, so like a, 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 um, a hall of mirrors if you like. Um, and that is that project. So the next project is uh, a project with we'll call Shadow House, and I'll, I'll probably should keep moving quickly. Um, and it is a, um, a single story renovation to a heritage building in Elstonwick. Elstonwick is a area in Melbourne that is um, uh, kind of notorious for its um, garden, um, tightly held planning regulations. Um, and um, so it's, uh, it has a, a number of uh, number of uh, Edwardian buildings, so reasonably sized and uh, Edwardian buildings are known for that kind of steep picturesque roof form 
um, their informality, if you like, asymmetry, diagonality. Um, and so our, I guess our response wanted to be contemporary, but it wanted to um, kind of um, enter into the spirit of the original uh, designs and provided it didn't obscure um, the concept of the, of, the, of the significant fabric. So um, this is the original building and then it had a, an 80s edition um, added um, in, in the 80s, kind of through from this point onwards. And it grouped a set of spaces that meant that all the living uh, areas were facing south and all the bedrooms were facing north, which was not ideal. And it was situated up against the northern boundary so and had a kind of a garden in shadow. So. Um, we removed the, uh, the non-significant fabric and then grouped a set of spaces um, around getting northern light into uh, the rear private open space and into the living areas, um, which was kind of a little bit awkward because we wanted not to attach the, the new fabric to the old necessarily, um, but we didn't want to create a big house either. So um, in the end it was about... Um, uh, so, we, so we actually reduced the number of bedrooms but we increased the living space so um, it was really about getting a kind of responsive site outcome and um, this is the way it kind of developed uh, so it was about getting northern space northern light into these living rooms and maximizing this northern flow um, and so in the end it result it kind of it revolved around these uh, three objects if you like so a brick object which was the existing uh, quarters, um, a timber object which was the utilities and a zinc object which was the guest quarters and carport and in between these these objects if you like is a series of interstitial living zones um, and we developed a number of form models to uh, for, for, the, for the new fabric we wanted it to be one unified kind of material form if you like and then underneath it was a I guess a kind of conceptual um, crumpling up of paper, a plaster ceiling that, that draped itself over these, these objects. Um, and this is, uh, this is, this is it. Um, so this kind of um, white underside of the, of the fractal ceiling that kind of, uh, or the faceted ceiling that um, wraps itself around the old object but doesn't touch the old object. And so you get this lovely kind of light coming through into the southern spaces and a clear distinction of these, you know, timber brick, zinc and brick. Um, this is the front of the house so we deliberately wanted the new works um, to be in the shadow of the old building and we wanted them to kind of meld in with the greenery of the garden and be kind of secondary to the heritage fabric. Um, you can see here um, and back to that plan. So there was a, uh, a gesture kind of th th between old and new here that we wanted this to be very transparent and non um, uh, non, non kind of opaque or, 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 or solid um, and also there was a, yeah, a, a separation through here where the old fabric doesn't touch the new. Um, this is that, that separation of, um, old, uh, of, of the zinc building and the brick and I guess it kind of it, it creates this yeah, interstitial zone between old and new but also extends out the, the living zone into the front yard and makes a connection with the street. Uh, and you can see here that disconnection with the old, the old fabric. And there's a lovely kind of um, green area here that will grow and is now fully grown over time and the, the, the owners can kind of manipulate that as they need to or a new owner could too. They can make it more private, less private, have a connection with the street or um, let the light come in as they please. And, and I guess this was a collaboration also with um, MIM Design Studio, who are an interior designer, and also Ben Scott, um, Landscape Architecture. So it was a great kind of um, connection of three different practitioners, and um, I think um, the result kind of shows the richness of that connection, and sometimes that was difficult, but um, I think uh, it has kind of worked very well, and um, and the end products turned out you know, really well. So uh, this, is, this is, again, showing that disconnection with the, the brick building, um, so getting light through here, having a very soft um, and, and unobtrusive connection. Uh, this is that interstitial zone. Uh, you can see here in the, in the, in the, um, in, in the sections that the disconnection. Um, this is the front door area, front entry. And I guess 
similar to the kind of Edwardian notion, that nouveau notion that sometimes you don't, you meander through a set of spaces, unlike the Victorian houses where they're very much you, you go down a hallway. This, uh, the Edwardians were more about meandering um, and sometimes going through a set of rooms as an entry sequence as opposed to um, down a hallway and then into some rooms. So this kind of follows that notion where this is your entry room, this is a salon that is the, their meet and greet and their art collectors. Um, so they come in, this is your entry room and then you, you move on through these spaces. Um, and this, this is a little reading library which was original from the previous, build, uh, the previous layout. So it becomes a very kind of moody kind of um, uh, snug space if you like uh, at night. Um, and then you move through and you move through this, this zone. Uh, there's a dining space here and, and this um, kind of little breezeway alcove. Uh, to that area. Um, there's a concrete, what we call the concrete monolith um, after uh, Space Odyssey. It's um, um, a bit of a, um, a play on materials which I'll talk about in a minute where, and where that's come from but um, I guess this building was all about exploring materials so different you know zinc, timber, brick, concrete. Um, uh, so yeah Ben Scott was a big hand in the, in the, in the garden. This is a blue trumpet vine which grows very quickly uh, very dense, deep, deep leaves. Um, a disconnection between old and new. And you can see here the kind of the, the objet or the objects, if you like, the, uh, the, the timber and the brick. And, um, and so, yes, yeah, the concrete, we wanted to. Um, I guess part of what we like is the dichotomies in design, so those um, elements where things are set against each other, so whether that's old and new, light and dark, um, materials that are um, distressed or polished, um, we like that, we like playing those off against each other, so I've always, I've had this sitting on my desk for years, this was just a slab on another project, just a floor slab, um, and just thought how wonderful and beautiful this distressed nature was and so um, what is called a, a bony finish which is like a um, uh, it's not a dry mix but it's a mix that has um, uh, low small aggregate and a lot of big aggregate sets fast and um, anyway it so we we, <laughs> we poured it like this and, and the builder said it was the most perfect imperfect um, concrete that he would ever poured um, and this is just showing detail, so de um, the cutting out of the brick to, to house the double glazing, um, uh, the, this connection here, and we had to have a double gutter so that some people could traffic through here. Um, and just some of the building shots, the, the construction shots, I can come back to those if, if need be. Um, and obviously there's a lot of rigour by the builder getting all these points to, to, to all align at the same point. Um, all the water retention um, um, was a bit of a feat in itself. Um, water e egress, I should say. And here's just the um, the cladding of that um, of the zinc. Um, and so we like we like a level of detail. We like we we I guess we're conceptual architects, but at the end of the day, we're driven by our detail. We love the pursuit of great detail, and uh, so this was getting this lovely drain and this con continuity of floor finish. Um, that's the rear of the building, um, so it was a warm roof, so-called warm roof, um, so that we could clad it up through here and not have, um, not have uh, uh, ridge caps. Um, and I guess what it was challenging, what the whole project was challenging was um, having the concept of heritage buildings, this is all in the her heritage, Elstonwick heritage area where poor quality design um, you know, connects itself with heritage design and in effect brings down the integrity of that design. What we're doing is um, completely contemporary but set off the um, existing building and so we think that that is a, um, you know, it, it, whilst it's contemporary now we think it's something that will hold for the future. Um, so, oh, there was a quick little video there. Um, <laughs>
all right, so quickly, Concrete House. So the Concrete House was a house in... Uh, yes. Face the audience. Face the audience, sorry. Uh, Concrete House is a house um, that we did in, um, uh, in, in Hampton, in Melbourne, um, and it was, the client was a, um, a, a builder and a concrete, an expert in concrete. So they came to us with a quite specific brief um, and uh, the, to use concrete basically as the prime construction material and, and um, make a feature of the concrete. Um, I feel that <laughs> this is not comparing to Indigo Slam <laughs> by any means, but um, uh, and he's no uh, he's no art benefactor or anything like that. But anyway, it's um, it's our humble little concrete house. Um, <laughs> um, so this was the existing site. Um, they had aspirations and accommodation requirements, as everybody does. But they came to us with a mid-century modern theme and. Um, when people come to you with that preset kind of idea, it's, um, um, you know, what do you do with that? It's, um, uh, it's something that we, um, we like to go ask them, what, what are the basics? What, is the, what was the atmosphere that is created in this? You know, we're not going to necessarily copy that, but um, what, is it, what are the um, characteristics of this that really um, are suitable for this project and what do you like? So um, there was... A mid-century modernist um, yeah, uh, preamble to it. This is the existing streetscape, so it's very eclectic and probably not worthy of mention. Um, and so laying out the building on the site, um, north was um, up the page and we had a street set back here. So it became pretty obvious that the uh, layout would kind of revolve around an east-west um, orientation. Um, so living spaces were um, up facing north, utilities and sleeping spaces south, and with an entry that kind of bisected the middle. Um, and we had setbacks at the top to comply with planning wise, and so we had this kind of layer cake um, arrangement kind of forming. Um, there were views to the city at the rear. This is just a um, kind of um, schematic design assemblage of um, obje objects, if you like. Um, and so this is where we got to, in the end, the. The floor plan involves, uh, as I say, a set of living spaces. So you come through the, the entry here and the master quarters are situated to the right. So there was a master bedroom, a uh, master ensuite and a, and a reflection pond, and then a, a powder room and um, uh, the white Anne's kind of study area. And then, um, and then you go through to the rear uh, and uh, as, as, uh, an assemblage of living spaces and then you go out and there's a pool and outdoor entertaining. Um, every space had a view to a garden so that was a prime kind of um, requirement. So every, every space has a view either to a private garden or to a, a larger garden. Um, and, um, and then the upstairs areas are kids rooms and a, a kids retreat area which overlooks the rear garden and a large void so a double height area to the living spaces. Um, so, in the end, we, we built boundary to boundary. Um, the stone is sourced from Greece. The client is, is Greek, and so this had a kind of sentimental um, um, uh, attachment to, to this stone. And so, I guess in a kind of programmatic sense, the stone um, is clad over anything that is concrete block, and then the timber clads anything that is openable. So this is all garage doors. This is these are. Um, uh, louvered bifold um, shutters over this window and then there's a, a steel shroud if you like that um, clads the entry area and then over this perch is the um, concrete um, uh, the concrete kind of box if you like um, and so there it is there um, this is the entry area so it had a double height void and, and a bridge between um, between the bedrooms and a, a light kind of uh, light well above it, light uh, skylight, and then you drop down into a, a lower set of rooms. So it was um, a sequence of uh, evolving spaces, if you like. Um, this is the central area, uh, so the, um, the the living zone. Um, behind here is the, uh, the the formal living, and above here is the retreat. And there's we wanted to retain the verticality here, so these are actually kind of mirrors. Um, here, which meant we could retain this vertical element and have this kind of flow of material and space. 
um, to the right, these doors uh, all open up and there's this 16 metre long kind of open glazed um, window. Um, so more of that central area. Concrete again used throughout. Um, and some of the, the more intimate areas, although it's, um, it seems like a grand space in spaces, we wanted to kind of keep that kind of uh, textural haptic quality to um, a lot of the other spaces. So timber and, and leather were used in, uh, in, in, the, in the more intimate spaces. And again, uh, through here, so concrete, bathroom, and, um, and stone tiles in the courtyard. Uh, this is this rear cabana area. Um, so we uh, worked with Rick Eckersley Landscapes. He did all the um, all the landscaping, the pencil pines, which again has that kind of slightly European uh, mid-century sensibility. Um, some of the concrete detailing and the and the, and the, the stone, um, and really the architecture and the tapered edges to that concrete box was about um, was about disguising views to neighbours and, and um, getting views and, and um, creating sun control. But it was also about breaking down the, the, um, the monolithic nature of concrete and really bringing it down to something that kind of belies the nature of what it is and getting a really soft, thin edge to it so that you'd almost think that it may not be concrete. Um, here's the detail of that. Here's that formwork. Um, I guess similar to wills, that top side's always a difficult one to um, achieve the right finish. Um, and that is that, that's night time. And so quickly now, um, this is some projects that haven't been photographed yet. I'll just be very quick. So this is North Melbourne Terrace. This is uh, in the middle of the city of Melbourne, in North Melbourne, very urban, built up area. Um, and uh, so we did an investigation on the, um, the streetscape, the fabric, um, catalogued a lot of, um, uh, I've lost that slide, but anyway, we did a cataloguing of all the different brick buildings in the area. It's very much like an East End London. There's a lot of, um, or parts of Sydney for that matter, a lot of um, Victorian, boom time Victorian buildings that then have these piggyback kind of wings, if you like, and they have one wing and then another wing and another wing. Um, and so we wanted to play on that, um, do a contemporary kind of incarnation, if you like, of, um, of a Victorian wing. Um, and so this was the existing, uh, this is an A-listed heritage building, by the way, so um, we could only do so much, we couldn't remove the rear element, so it stayed. And then it's a long block and we had to deal with a number of different neighbours, so we set back a courtyard in here. North is up the page, by the way. And then uh, created a, a kind of a wing element that almost mimics the neighbour's wing element. And um, uh, had to remove it off the boundary here and boundary here due to neighbours. So I guess the neighbour had kind of set the, the layout in, in many respects. Um, this is a section, so the existing house. Um, and you can see here new elements are attached to the, 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 the old part of the building and then we kind of pretty much burrowed out through the middle so we completely propped the old part of the building and, and burrowed out a clean footprint underneath. Um, you know, this, is, this is the cataloguing. Um, so just looking at these, this, these elements. Um, and. Uh, so this was a derivation of the original design. We're looking at using a black brick. In the end, we went for a, quite a bit of brick got removed. So we thought, let's, let's utilize the same brick. Let's re-salvage all that same brick that was being removed from the original building and re reuse it on the new element. Um, so it uh, is, a, is a bit of a play on this, this um, form over here, um, but just very much takes out all the accessorizing. So there's no, um, there's no window architraves, there's no, uh, uh, there's no gutters, no roof, um, no, no ridge capping. It's all very clean. So we've used a steel window, brick walls, brick roof, and, um, and hit and miss brickwork through here, which um, is due to privacy, but also getting light into, into these areas. Uh, so this was the existing plan. Um, and then you can see we've 
uh, ground level, pretty much burrowed out through here, clean footprint, upper floor, we've attached this element to the existing zone and created a void through to get some uh, vertical connection from, front, from, from ground to first and then a series of bedrooms, so uh, yeah, existing rooms, common bathroom oh, and toilet and, and, and some bedrooms. And you can see here the connection of this roof. Uh, so these just construction shots, which weren't that long ago. So this has all been taken out and this has been propped. Um, and these are just the sketch up images. So this is this kind of, again, this courtyard through the middle, which we needed to do to set back for that neighbor. But it creates a nice light air connection for the middle of the house. There's a barbecue and a um, kind of uh, kitchen meals area. And then you go down a level to uh, the, the uh, the rear area and we wanted to actually expose some of the older elements so rather than covering over them again let's let's actually um, remove the plaster and have them uh, El Natural um, and, and a light ability to get light down through the levels as well notoriously the Victorian houses are very dark as you know um, and then this was the so the rear elevation so we wanted to kind of disconnect um, have this clear and almost almost looks like this floor has kind of just pulled itself up off the timber floor here and then the brickwork runs around and, and runs around through here in a darker coloured garden to match in with the brickwork uh, and there's a wall of joinery along this side uh, and now here it is in reality. Um, these are some of the, again this is, these are just happy snaps but um, you come through here and we've, this is actually a laundry um, within this element so it's all very tight and confined but We've run a more contemporary kind of um, smooth surface to run around and tuck um, in under here, the, the old brickwork and then a timberline ceiling. The courtyard you can see there, again we've kind of recessed um, doors within brickwork which was a bit of an effort here, I'm getting through concrete and, <laughs> um, and then the upstairs, this void. So. Um, Beautiful, getting lovely light down here, getting this lovely texture, utilising that old system of the uh, those old S ties that they used to use, um, and just some other images. Um, and so the brickwork, uh, so this was all re-salvaged, and the roof, unfortunately, is not a solid brick roof, but um, uh, it's pretty close. Um, it's. Uh, it was, look, it was a budget-driven project. This was about a million dollars or 1.1 or so. So um, uh, this, this shows you, I'll show you the roof detail in a sec. Um, the hit and miss we wanted to, because um, there's actually a window back in here, but th this is not windowed. So we went from a very open aperture down to a very refined aperture, um, almost to sol solidity there. Um, so having it more open where the window was and less open where it wasn't. Um, this is the window, so it's at the end of a kind of a long corridor which could be pretty banal, it actually adds some lovely light and air and um, texture. This is a frosted glass window, it had to be, and so you get this lovely kind of um, dappling of light through here, and there's a kind of bedroom here. This is the upstairs, uh, the brick roof. Uh, so the brick roof is actually just this element here, and then we, for budget reasons, and, and because you don't see it, <laughs> um, you, it's just a, it's a metal roof, so there was no getting past the client with bricking the whole roof. Um, and so, look, it's, it's a lightweight roof. It was uh, timber construction underneath. Um, it's then flashed um, beneath the compressed FC sheet. It is then tanked, uh, a la a, um, a shower would be tanked, or a wet, a wet, a wet space. And then there's a high performance glue where these brick snaps are glued to the um, a rubber glue, I think it is, that they're glued to the tanking and then it's um, uh, mortared in the same way that um, this, so using the same mortar, um, but is flashed and tanked. So um, that was the methodology. You can see there the rest of the roof. Um, detail. And some other snaps, so it'll be photographed at some stage soon. This is very quickly, this is only a slide or two on this. This is a uh, mixed use um, development we're doing in Wellington Street and St Kilda, an infill development. So there's, I think it's a six metre wide frontage between these two high buildings. 
and it's just, this is a photograph, um, um, so it's commercial space down below. This is actually an existing wall from the previous building, so we wanted to ret retain some of the story of the old building. And then there's a group of um, kind of kind of detailed boxes, if you like, that um, that house uh, or that kind of um, yeah that outlay the different stories and the different spaces within the building. Um, that's a quick section cut through. So it's commercial on the ground level, and this is actually a residence at the top level. So it's a series of bedrooms, the ground level, the living spaces on this second level, this first floor level. There's a void up to get light and air down through it, and then there's a uh, a bedroom and a secondary living space, I think, and then there's a the main rooftop garden and deck up top. Um, so you can see here, this is, it had an interesting site predicament because on the rear side there's actually a freeway, or, or a highway at least, and so there's a small park which we wanted to access, so you can get access through here to that, but otherwise these wanted to be completely acoustically kind of separated, so this is the, the curtain wall that is uh, facing that freeway. And that is about it. This is another project, but it, um, I don't have much to say about this. This is, <laughs> this is a, uh, a, uh, a project that isn't photographed, but it involves a curtain that um, deals with the west-facing light issue. And, um, and again, that kind of inside, outside, and old with new, and that's enough for me. Thank you. As was the hope when we started putting this series of double talks together, there's a richness in what is shared. There's a whole um, breadth of knowledge. There's a generosity of spirit. There's behind the scenes all the things that I hope for. So thank you to both of you. That's the kind of presentation I have expected or hoped for that we can share and discuss. And for us all to see and compare you know, the things that we go through in our own projects, um, the things we relate to, the things we would like to see, the reveal, um, like a magician's trick, that brick roof is fantastic because <laughs> while it is giving the game away, it also shows that through a bit of innovation, um, we can achieve things. And there is sometimes a bit of sleight of hand. If you go to John Stone's house, there's lots of it. Mm -hmm. So. Um, and through a whole tradition of architecture. So this is the intent of this series, that we showcase architect works, their thoughts, their um, approaches, their individualism, and through that understand some shared experience as well. Um, then on the word experience, both of you have used it and um, express the desire in your work to create experience and for me that is very much the heart of architecture or at the heart of architecture which isn't always the case in every piece of built work but it is certainly what we've heard these two people explore. Um, in terms of starting a discussion I suppose the things that came through and Matt, I don't think you need to apologise. No, <laughs> right. you know, I mean, yeah. the, the way this is set up, it's not a compare and contrast. It's yeah, not yeah, yeah. you're better than me or any of that. No, it's no. it's about um, a whole range of possibilities, a whole range of experiences, and we all have differences. We have things that overlap, and it's not about anything else mm. apart from sharing the experience of that work. Mm. And for me, part of what you did share was a return to the idea of material, the idea of detail, the idea of light. And then you both mentioned experience. So I think that was a really wonderful thing to see. Totally. Um, my question relates to both of you, but I'll start with you, Matt, since you just finished talking. The idea of a body of knowledge 
and that you worked for other people beforehand. And you did touch on that when you introduced yourself. Mm. And it was David Collins you worked for, wasn't mm -hmm. it? Mm -hmm. yeah, so it's mm. not just any interior designer. Mm -hmm. you know, mm. th there's a pretty good name that you worked for, mm. and the things that you learned from that, and then the other places you work, and then the things that you do as a practitioner yourself. So you're building on that body of knowledge. I just wanted you to say a few more words, both of you, about um, your understanding of where you've ended up from through that process. Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, uh, well, I'm, yeah, I'm actually a country boy to start with, so I am. Um, and it's funny, I mean, it, uh, yeah, so I lived in the country, I moved to Melbourne, schooled in Melbourne, then I went to London and lived in London, and so I went from the opposite of, uh, you know, seeing uh, that really rustic rural tin shed, um, you know, corrugated iron, she shearing shed, all that kind of thing through to the most beautiful mm. restaurants in London that you've ever seen, you know, um, and fashion retail, and so I did a lot of that as well. So, um, and, you know, our office, I don't think necessarily does that, but it's, you can't help but be um, defined by your experiences of space, can you? So, um, so I think where... But, but you're certainly not ignoring that idea of detail and material. Mm, no. you, know, you might be doing it in your own way, mm. but you really care about it, mm. and not everybody does. Mm. Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think, uh, I mean, I've always been that way driven. I, I think, William, you are too. Um, um, but it's, I mean, a lot of architects are conceptual, and, and, uh, and maybe the detail is secondary. You know, that doesn't matter because the concept's the big thing. Um, and then there's other de architects that, uh, you know, the detail is... Um, everything, you know, um, and there's that poetic and there's that more conceptual um, social comment, if you like. Um, you know, there's these three different areas of architecture. There was a great, um, I think Le uh, Leon von Skyke had a, a, a map of um, all the architects in Australia and he popped them in different kind of areas. Um, so I, I think we're probably more in that detail mm -hmm. zone and that's what makes us tick. I mean, I, um, that's what kind of drives me. I get a real kick out of, mm. you know, doing something new or exploring something beyond what, you know, you've done before, and that's about detail. And making it work. And making it work, yeah. yeah. Maybe, William, do you want to talk about just that body of knowledge and where it's taken you? Mm. Um, I'm also from the country. <laughs> um, but I, I ended up working in London for Norman Foster, and I... I remember on my first day there, I was asked to work on a reception counter, and um, and I thought I did. I thought I nailed it. Actually, I was really happy with what I did. <laughs> and then the associate looked at it and said, "That's not how we do it here." Um, and they threw it in the bin and they said, "Go and copy one from another project and make it fit this situation." And <laughs> and at the time I thought that was absurd. And then I learnt that they had their way of doing that, and my time there was to learn how they did that. Um, after a few years of that, you kind of learnt their way of working and then um, the journey of my practice was started when I felt like I needed to discover who I was and what I wanted to do and what I liked and, and therefore all the work that I do is about that exploration and um, the little, you know, the, it kind of evolves for me over time and uh, I've been doing it for nearly 20 years now, so there's a whole series of projects that build up to a, an amazing project like Indigo Slam. And along the way, um, things have happened. And, and the reason why that little story about the language and the poetry and the sculpture happened is just that I was running one day in a park and I saw this piece of sculpture and I thought, that's, that's it. That's exactly what I've been trying to do in my work. Now I'm going to use that on this particular project and explore that and then that and then that changes for us again the the playing field has moved on we do things a bit differently now we reference that work but you know we're we're doing new projects after indigo slam and exploring different things and different materials and and what are the inherent qualities of those materials and what can we do structurally and how can we um, change all of that and apply that to new concepts. So all of it I feel like is this big kind of mashup of, of 
the work that is referencing itself and building on the knowledge that we've uh, come to experience. Um, and it's, it's constantly growing and evolving, which is kind of why I wanted to show something like the Rail Operations Center, which is, you know, again, a kind of budget driven project, but incredibly ambitious in building 66 meter long arches and seeing if we can pull that off and then what do you do with all that? I think it's obvious that there's been this transition through your body of work. It leads me to one of my other questions, which is that there seems to be, and you kind of answered it, but I want to know a little more. There seems to be no house style. You know, you have no, some architects have an approach, like Foster, um, and that's it. And that's the rules that you will follow. Whereas you seem more curious and you talked about finding something that inspired you. I think it's this microphone making that weird noise. Anyway, sorry for the weird noises. We've got uh, ghosts. Um, the, the, this curiosity then drives your direction rather than a dogmatic approach to one particular direction. And I find that um, both heartening and uh, it must be a bit liberating for you that you don't feel yourself straitjacketed by having put yourself into a particular direction. For both of you. Mm -hmm. I think um, Matt really touched on exactly what we do. It's a, it's a response to the client, it's a response to the site, it's a response to uh, the problems and the opportunities and and I hope that 20 years from now we'll look back on our work and think that we made good choices about what was around so we're just uh, finishing a block of apartments in Sydney that are all in white glossy tiles that just kind of respond to a southern aspect and I feel like it picks up the light beautifully it's it's a different look it's a different shape it's uh, a lot of the details are borrowed and, and developed and refined and moved forward. Um, and often I'll just start a project with talking to my clients about their favourite artists or what music they like or, uh, or what is it that really will make them love their homes or, or the places that they're going to live and then try to develop a really nice connection based on that. So the concept's rooted in who they are and and how this will fit for them. Yeah, like the Indigo Slam story. Yeah. William, um, having the opportunity to work with Judith is very, very special. She's a very special lady. I don't know how much you know about her in the White Rabbit Gallery, but um, John Wardle won the um, Tapestry Workshop Architecture Design Prize last year. And I sit on the board of the Australian Tapestry Workshop, and Judith, um, heard about this uh, tapestry and just wrote a check for a couple hundred grand so that we could actually actually weave it. So, I mean, this is a, an incredible client. Um, that wasn't the question. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm interested, um, having built a huge house in Melbourne for Indonesian clients, which is an off-form concrete house, not allowed to publish it. Um, the process you went through to get the quality that's there, which is better than Ando's concrete, in my experience, did you work with joiners to actually uh, develop the formwork for it and the quality control processes in actually realising it? Uh, no, it was, it was with a particular concreter that I've worked with for years. And... Mm. Um, <laughs> He's got an extraordinary ego, by the way. <laughs> but um, we work together and we fight and we, we battle our way through it. So, you know, a quarter of the formwork gets ripped down and started, starts again. I, you know, the, it's, it's a one-off thing. You, you can't get to pull the concrete back down again. So that's, that's the period where I would go to site every day to check the concrete and take my tape measure out and with that expectation he knew that it had to be done that way and um, you know so there's a lot of tricks to the trade so to curve the formwork it's, it's many sheets of form that are laid over each other so we have six mil sheets of veneer instead of 20 and then we laminate them up all of the the formwork is templated so 
uh, to make a curve like that, there is almost like um, joists that are made up. And so all the framework goes up in curves. And then we measure and check that. And then the layers of plywood go on and the tie rods go through and the reinforcing and so forth. So it's um, a lot of coordination and mostly a lot of checking, really. Mm. Yeah. I'd like to say it's all great teamwork, but there's quite a bit of fighting in there as well to make sure the quality is retained. I can't imagine... Happy you, fighting, happy fighting. I can't imagine you laying down the law. To say, I'm sure you do, but... It's <laughs> 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 so eloquent. Right? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. We, we all do it, I think. Formal expression within the house reminds me of Jose Luis Cert in certain areas. Is that a, any consciousness there, or is it a consequence of just the the idea carried through to those kinds of outcomes? Yeah, not not said at all. No. I don't. I know of his work, but no. don't really. I've never really studied it. The um, you know the the kind of references are you know beautiful. The beautiful monasteries by John Pawson. The the Bugsford Church by Utzon, um, those kinds of references through there. Don't need to look at that. Um, Matt, um, thank you for putting Elstonwick on the on the screen. Um, <laughs> map. I was I was born in Elstonwick right. and uh, not in the country, but I grew up in Tasmania. But you've now been in practice under your current guys for about 13 years mm -hmm. as a, one hell of a body of work. Um, the process you go through, is it a traditional one in terms of documentation and tender and due process? Mm -hmm. I've been trying to do one project in Bali for 16 years <laughs> and it's not finished, so well done. Uh, I think it is. It's, um, uh, we, we used to always tender, so we always used to have a competitive tender, just because I always thought that maintained the control on the level of detail. Um, but we are now um, doing it another way where we get a, the builder in at, so we've got our four, four or five favourite builders that we rotate, and um, we get them in at the end of planning. So the planning permit's been received, we bring them in and we do a little kind of deal that I think other architects do. but. Just to let you know, we, we, we introduce the client to the builder. We say, client, you pay the builder a $5,000 fee for their intellectual property and their um, ability to workshop with us. So they become part of, part of the project team then. And uh, so the client gets all that value out of it. Um, they can still go to a tender situation if they want to. Um, so that's put on the table to the builder straight up. You don't, if you don't want to be involved, that's fair enough. But if you do, then this is the situation. Often the client won't go to a tender situation because they've got such a great rapport with the builder by that time. But if they do, then the builder at least, if they don't get the, um, the job, they are paid in some way, shape or form for their time. And so a lot of builders say we don't need to be paid, but I think it's important they are paid actually because it sets a, sets a situation. Um, and uh, so... It gives value to the... It gives value, exactly, exactly. To the knowledge yes, the yeah. that's right. Um, and so that seems to be working quite well and I think that's a, yeah, I think it's a perhaps slightly non-traditional way, but um, I think as projects get bigger, that's almost the only way to do it, I, I kind of think, but um, anyway. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that, that would lead me to, to the next question because this methodology is that one of the things you may have learnt from your forum mm. and there is a question directly about that so I'll yeah. ask the official question mm. and then uh, love to hear more from Matt about how the small, medium and large practice forums work in Victoria. Yes. So I remember talking to you in Venice about this and it's mm. a very special thing mm. that I think these people need to know about. Yeah, okay. So. Yes, in Victoria we have a um, we have this wonderful uh, collegiate. Or with um, look, it generally is at the, at the larger practice level, it can get a bit more competitive. But um, certainly, uh, we've about ten years ago we had a a small practice forum and a sole practitioner forum, and that that went well. But the sole practitioners never turned up, and the small practice forum went really well. Anyway, it's developed into a small practice forum and a medium practice forum. So I, I run the medium practice forum, which is, um, uh, has members of, so they've got to be a practice principal between five and 25 um, staff members. And so it's this fantastic um, 
group of people that get together every two months and discuss everything under the sun. It's in a closed room, it's in a vault, no one can talk, so it's all confidential. Um, and we discuss things like... I think the official term is Chatham House Rules. <laughs> yeah, right, yes. What is talked yeah. about stays in that room in the, stays in, in the room. room. Yeah. Yes. Um, so we all get, I mean, the practices you would all know, the likes of um, Make and Claire Cousins mm -hmm. and Kennedy Nolan and JCB and Architects Eat and um, all these great practices um, come together and just share IP basically to talk mm -hmm. about staffing, talk about culture, leadership, um, um, design, fees, design clients, manifestos, fees, fees, client, exactly. Yeah. Yep, yep. And so it sets a, a benchmark. Um, we talk about finances, so we talk about um, our financial ratios for the year. We um, table that, and here's here's what we're all doing. Why we're we not earning enough? All that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, and it's all we've. I mean, some of it's been used for to go to the institute, but a lot of it's all kind of confidential and our own stuff. Um, I mean, we have have been a couple of task groups that have come out of that, which did a, we did a procedures manual, for example, for some medium practices, mm -hmm. procedures template manual. Um, but look, it's great. It's um, and and small practice forum is similar. It's for um, zero to five staff practices, but I've been speaking to a couple of Sydney architects and they were saying, God, we don't have that in Sydney and wouldn't it be great if... Mm. Well, other... That's why I think it's good yeah. to talk about that. Yeah. That, you know, you might not think of the possibility that, you know, you might be able to share that kind of thing given egos, given mm. not giving away IP, not giving away um, <laughs> knowledge that mm. shouldn't be shared. but but it's all to the benefit of the profession mm, and mm. to yourself in a way because you're mm. going to learn stuff mm. that you don't know. You might be giving stuff away, yep. but you're getting something in return and I think it's yeah. fantastic. Well, it's, it's, it's funny that you would think that, that you'd go into a room and you'd probably hold a little bit back, but as soon as everyone gets talking, <laughs> everyone wants to get out with, oh, I've done this and I've done that and hey, mate, do it this way and it all comes out. So it's, um, <laughs> it's great, yeah. Mm. I, I set up the large practice forum in Sydney back in the 2001 or 2002 and um, it's never really achieved the kind of um, substance that your mm. groups in Melbourne have actually achieved so I think there's a lot of feedback and learning that um, should be brought back to Sydney we certainly mm. as you say mm. do not have the small practice forum mm. um, as a formal kind of mm. setup that happens mm. in in smaller regional groups. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So well, well done. Yeah, no, it's, it's very beneficial for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, before I do any kind of wrapping up, is there any burning question out there that hasn't been asked or dealt with or issue raised? Yes. Um, well, if I have a detailing question. Yes. Your work flaws in both your projects are amazing. Can you tell us a bit about the flaws and how they're constructed without losing the water? Good question. Mm. Um, the bricks are all just loose, loose laid. So we'll pushed into, just glued down like tiles. Yeah. So they're regular bricks laid on the edge and they're glued down using tile, tile mortar and then no, no grout, just open joins and, uh, and then waxed. So we use a product called Whittle Wax and there's one coat with a, a 5% whiteness to it, so it's just slightly lifted, and then the final coat is just regular whittle wax. And you can, it's a, it's a, it's a wax made for wood. And How does that apply? You just rub, rub it on with a rag. Yeah. It's a lot of rubbing. Sore knees. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is that be used for ramps? Sorry? Is that used more than ramps? Yep. yep, yep. It looks, it feels like brick when it's finished, it just repels water a bit. Um, it's not a, it's by no means a, a perfect finish, so if red wine goes on there it'll stain, it won't come off, but the own, owners quite like that. We just generally say to clients, if you want this, then it comes with an imperfect future, and, and this particular owner loves that, and, you know, so that's kind of great. Um, and people worry about the joints, but you don't need to worry about that, the, the dirt falls into the joints. It's a good thing. <laughs> and eventually seagulls. Hey, seal up. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Um, I'd, I'd just raise one other thing. You and I were chatting briefly beforehand about working on different types of projects and you're working on these multi-residential projects and you were trying to do what you did in that little 
apartment building, about concrete walls and concrete floors. Do you want to tell that story about focus groups? And how things working working with ah. in the corporate world. Gosh, yeah, it's difficult. Um, <laughs> I, I was showing you a set of two success projects and uh, we, we also um, have just finished a, a project with Lendlease and another, we've just finished one with Murbach and they're, they're quite challenging and what I've learnt with those projects is to, to just go after a couple of things really hard and hold on to that. And so I was <laughs> telling Stephen before how we started a project, we won a competition actually by saying we've just done this building, we've used a lot of concrete in the last few years, we think this apartment building needs concrete ceilings, it's got to have this really beautiful robust dockside feeling to it and that was the winning entry of the competition with this idea of Danish joinery and then it went to a focus group and they said um, yeah we like that but we don't think that the walls can be concrete either so you've just you can do white plasterboard walls with concrete ceilings um, and we thought yeah it's okay yeah let's just just do it and we'll change the floor surface and we'll be fine and then it went to another focus group and they said that the market may not like that so you can do a feature concrete area of the ceiling and most of it's got to be plasterboard. <laughs> and then we thought, no, it's just can concrete all together and we'll do a really lovely stucco finish. And then went to another focus group and they canned that. <laughs> so, um, so what, I, what I've really learned in that process, yeah, is it's, those projects are also about a lot of compromise and, and just kind of really holding firm on a few things. We, we say this is critical and we're not going to um, give in on that. And we're doing a 26 story brick building in the city, it's a hotel. And um, in uh, total stubbornness, I've just represented the, f I've been told four times to change the facade. And I've come up with four different options and they've finally given in on the fourth option. I'm just delighted, but it takes a lot of perseverance mm -hmm. as well to try and not be bowled over by, um, pushy developers and and people who, who don't really care about quality. I, I went to this great uh, landscape talk in the city um, a couple of years ago by this incredible Chilean uh, landscape architect by the name of Teresa Moller. She does the most amazing poetic work and she has a translator and she was telling these wonderful stories about how she worked with landscapes and trees and so forth. And someone in the audience said at the end, it must be easier in Chile than it is here because we have all this red tape and it's so difficult in Australia. And then the translator just took over and they said, oh my God, it's so hard, you know. This woman works so hard. She's so um, <laughs> stubborn, she's so difficult. The clients kind of hate her at points and they get to the end and they realise how, how great it is. And mm. we kind of go through that journey as well. Mm. Maybe not to the same beautiful ends that she does, but. There are There's a, a, a lot of perseverance and, you know, kind of um, negotiations, I'll call it, to try and get a really good outcome and, you know, a lot of double up work to try and push through. Can I, can I ask, William, the, um, the circumstances in Sydney with the competitive design process, mm. how do you find yourself um, within that kind of um, situation and um, the consequence of of dealing with um, with the outcomes of of the competitive process yeah, itself. Um, this, so I don't know if you know, but in Sydney, when it's a major building, so it's over 50 metres in height the or 25 city, in the city of Sydney. 25 million in value, then it must go to competitive process, and they select between three and five architects to do it. Um, for us, it's been very good, and um, there's a few good things about it. What's hard for us is it costs so much to enter the comp. So you get paid 50 grand, it costs us 100 to do it. Mm -hmm. And if you lose three in a year, then it's mm -hmm. not good. Um, but there's the rules of the competition. So the rules are once the competition winner is chosen, then the design must be adhered to. And it really, the city is incredibly supportive of maintaining the design control. And so we, um, try to really lock that down in a DA stage and and the quality of buildings in the city of Sydney is, is really improving as a result of this and it's also giving a lot of new young players um, a foot into the markets it's sort of it's lifting quality it's getting more diversity um, the support of the city is tremendous it's been very successful I think 
and it's a process of growing into the outer um, yeah. councils and yeah. Uh, yeah, there's as a bit well. Of a template so that other people. So yeah. you're saying that legislating for quality is actually producing quality rather than the people arguing about the nanny state we've got to have less legislation that's a very critical legislation saying that you've got to have competitive um, design competitions in it. Is yes. that part of the improvement? Because we don't have any Queensland. Yeah, it okay. definitely is. So um, what, it, what it really does is uh, it takes, it puts you into a point in time where someone will look at your work and say, is this the best of these entries? So to get to that point, you have a brief and you have a set of controls. And most of the time we enter them, we think this control is ludicrous or there's a better way of doing this. And then we'll, we will make a calculated risk on breaking a, breaking a rule or breaking a control. And, and it takes the jury to a point in time when they look at that and they say, here are the rules, this is the outcome, does it really make sense? And so what you get in the city is often rules which are not straight out of the box solutions that are responses to controls, but they are creative responses. Um, you can also get knocked out of the comp by doing that. So I've had that happen before as well. Broken the rules, you're out of the game. But generally I think it, it opens that up. And also what it, so, so the jury is forced to make a decision on things that comply and don't at the same time, rather than planners doing that. Mm. And, so and often architects on the jury, is that right? That's yes. Yeah. 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 The, the jury is led by often very esteemed architects and they'll make really um, sensible decisions about those things. So that's changing the dynamic. Yes. yes. Yep. Totally. It, mm. you know, it comes with certain flaws as well, but it has improved the quality of the built environment in the city of Sydney. What are the flaws? Oh, we don't have enough time for that. Right? <laughs> I'll talk to you afterwards, perhaps. But uh, James had a question, so let's go to him before we wrap up. Uh, as, I guess, a, a builder in terms of materials and paint put materials together, I was going to but my question is more about to both of you. Where do you go for a morning coffee at 9 a.m. on a winter morning? And I think there are some buildings, <coughs> places that have been put forward where you can find a space to do that. And then what is the experience when you find that space? Um, um, so you go for a coffee and... So within, within the project. Within the project. So within a house or... Yeah, so I, I don't, within yep. what you both put forward. Yeah. So, yeah, so I don't quite understand the question. So I sit there in my house and, yep. and there is a spot where I sit in the winter sun yep. and, and you hear and smell and enjoy actually where you are. Mm. And I think they came across in some project, but, mm. but some of them. Mm. And I'd love to know mm. how, how both of you see that you actually live in your places. Mm. Design on those occasions. Hmm. Um, I think uh, a lot of that comes through in the client interaction. So I think a little, a little bit like what Will said before about actually when we get a client brief and we're interrogating who they are, getting them to you know embellish, you know. Who are you? Where have you come from? What are your uh, um, experiences of space previously? Um, and what you know, what what makes what makes a comfortable space for you? What's your in your mind? What's a comfortable space? And I guess as an architect, we all know we 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 come to a client and it's a collaboration always. It's trying to get to a same mindset, a same place. You we propose things and we. Um, you try to meet at a level, and I guess every client is different for us and, and for all of us and for Will, um, and which is the exciting thing about it, that you, you have um, different things come out of that and they don't all look the same. And, um, and so I, I think what you're saying is uh, those little moments of um, kind of beauty or 
um, reflection, I don't know, those little special moments in a place. Is that what you're talking about? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it's more specific to, to making place as well, mm -hmm. orientation, and mm -hmm. how do you actually occupy a place? And I put for winter because it's the hard, winter morning is the hardest time to mm. deal with. Mm. So you can find a beautiful place, you know, people kind of increasing around Italy, and you go, where do I get a lovely spot to have a coffee in the sun? Mm. So I think if you can't do that in a project, mm. then mm. It, it, it might be poor. So where does that happen in It's a typical change, yeah. Um, well, uh, I mean, we do. We have different. I mean, in the shadow house, for example, we had a lovely west-facing. Uh, well, all that window is west-facing, in fact. So, um, and there's a little uh, kind of little snug area. I mean, th this is just an example. This is one particular place, but um, it's one of those areas where you can. I don't know. For me, it was a a, a place where you can sit down, read a book, um, look out at the garden. Um, imagine yourself in another place, be swept away from where you are. Um, but there's all sorts of, the, the, that is, I don't know, when I'm thinking about space, I'm thinking about the emotional aspects of space. So I kind of, I think we think, I think I think more inside out than outside in. I'm thinking about how light comes in, how um, textures and materials play off. Um, yeah, so it's kind of a, there's a, lot, there's a holistic thing, there's a lot of things going on, but... Um, I think it's a very big question. Do you have one mm, little comment mm, yeah. before? Uh, um, maybe we can, you can have a chat with James <laughs> after. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, the Indigo Slam house is north facing and is very tall um, kind of glass windows and there's great uh, winter light. Um, I would I'd just sort of like to sort of say on that point that the relationship that we develop goes down to the point of do you want to look out the window when you're having a shower and do you care about people seeing you and when you're having a bath how do you like to look and and how many handbags do you have and do you roll your socks up uh, it's we get down to that point of detail and then the design in the end reflects that so the indigo slam house has a an arrow slit that looks down a particular view that goes to chest height for my 70 year old client um, so she can have a shower and look at the day. Um, so we do, we do kind of get down to that level of um, bespoke design of the house and to the point of where do you have coffee, how do you like to cook, you know, where, do, where does everything in your kitchen go? And in the end it all kind of fits. I got the, the nicest letter from her at the end that just said, um, it said, I, I actually don't like the tap in my house. And apart from that, I love everything about it. <laughs> so we're changing the tap now. Um, but the, you know, it was all the little surprises. There's PowerPoints in the back of the drawers for the hairdryer and, you know, it kind of lots of thinking and care about all those things. So it's, it's like a glove, I think. Um, a glove to store your stuff, but also to enjoy your day and and, uh, and your art and all the, the lovely things you have. Yeah. Well, I think we've, we've certainly enjoyed our day. And thank you again both <laughs> for wonderful presentations. Thank you to the audience for coming in the first place. Thank you for it's sticking great. around. Please stay, we've got some more drinks. Come and have a chat to these guys. James, you can wait till the end. <laughs> um, uh, and if you're, not on the, if you're not on the mailing list, Please talk to the Brickworks people, get yourself on there, let your friends know we're going to continue this, we're going to have more great speakers come and talk to you. Thank you very much. <laughs>